right guys, we're gonna try some multiple choice. If you're feeling comfortable with this material or you feel like you might wanna challenge yourself a little, push pause right now and try and do these problems on your own and then unpause it and come back. And if you're not feeling like you're up for that yet, no problem. We've got a whole other page of multiple choice questions so you can try those on your own as well before I go over them and just test your understanding a bit. But here we go. We're gonna use the following setting for examples 11 through 14. The National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health interviews a random sample of 4,877 teens all right, between grades seven and 12. One question asked was, what do you think are the chances you will be married in the next 10 years? Here is a two-way table of responses by gender. So before I even get going on this problem, I can hear that those 4,877 teens they were asked a categorical variable, right? What, what do you think the chances are that you'll be married? And it looks like they put them into one of five categories. Almost no chance, some, 50-50, good chance, almost certain. And they broke them up by gender. So I can hear there are two categorical variables. All right, so I'll just call them generically marriage chances. and gender. All right, another thing I see is a, a bunch of frequency counts, right? I see a ton of frequencies. Whenever I see frequencies, I get suspicious, right? I'm definitely gonna be turning, well not definitely, but I'm likely to be turning those in to relative frequencies. So ultimately for this problem, we're in prop land, right? I've actually got 10 categories here, 10 categories. And whenever I'm above two when I'm at three or more, I know I'm going chi-squared. All right, so I'm gonna be doing some kind of chi-squared test. Now, because I have two categorical variables, this would be, if, if they ask me to run the hypothesis test, it's gonna be a test for independence. All right, so let's see what the questions are. It says, the expected count of females who respond almost certain is, all right, so I want females almost certain. And basically, I want the parentheses that are there. Now, you have a couple of options. You could plug this into a matrix, run the chi-squared test, and then see what the individual expected counts are that they would drop into matrix B. I think what I'm gonna try and do here is just figure out the row total and the column total because they're only asking me for one expected count. So for the row total here, if I, oh, they still want me to change my batteries. I gotta remember to do that. If I take 1174 and I add to it 756, I'm looking at 1930 over here. And if I, Add the numbers in the column. We've got 119, 150, 447, 735, 1174. It looks like I've got 2625 over here. And they told me that the grand total was 4877. So I'm just going to do the quick and dirty version of getting the expected count. So we want female plus almost certain, right? And that's always row total times column total. And I'm gonna divide that out by grand total. All right, so that would have been, row total was 1930. Column total was um, 2625. And the grand total down here was 4877. So let's see what these numbers get me. So it looks like we have 1930 times 2625, and I'm gonna divide that by 4877. Looks like I'm at 1038.8. And as I look over here, boom. Okay, great. Now, the other way you could have done this, if you wanted to, is you could have gone into your matrix, right? I could edit out matrix A, and this time I had five rows and two columns, so it was longer than it was wide, and I can type in all of this data, all of my observed data. Again, I never need to type in my totals. Your calculator is more than capable of doing those or getting those totals for you. Okay, let me just do a quick check to make sure you don't have any typos. It's looking good. Hey, I'm looking good. Okay, so let me go ahead and run the chi-squared test. 
And then I can go back into my matrix. You see matrix B now has the correct dimensions and there is the 1038.8. So I don't know which one you feel is more efficient for you. For me personally, when I'm just doing one expected count, I don't really wanna put everything into a matrix. I'll just do row total, column total over grand total, but, but you have an option, whichever one you feel more comfortable with. All right, degrees of freedom. Okay, so degrees of freedom in the independence version, all right, it's, it's gonna be number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. Okay, so we had five rows and we had two columns. So ultimately I'm looking at four times one which is four, all right? And I also could have seen that from the calculator screen output when I ran the chi-square test. It'll, it'll give you your degrees of freedom. So, okay, great. All right, let's take a look at the next one. The next one says, hey, which cell gives you the largest contributor, right? So the cell in the table that contributes most to the chi-square test statistic is, and they're asking us which one. Okay, so when I say contributes most, it looks like we have a, uh, a total chi-squared test statistic of 69.8. So each of those 10 cells, those 10 categories are contributing. I just gotta figure out which between the three of these contributes the most, or is it that all cells contribute equally? Well, let's look at female and we'll go 50-50. So I'm gonna start this over here. So we'll go contributor for, what do we have, female? and 50-50. All right, so our contributors are always observed minus expected squared over expected, right? That's the test statistic, at least that's the contributor part. When we add up everybody's contribution, we get the test statistic. So let's look at female and then 50-50. All right, so let me scooch this back down here. All right, so I want female 50-50, so I'm right here. Now, I don't know what I expected, Right, I see what I observe. So let me go back into the matrix and figure this out. So we'll go here. It looks like I expected 516.2. So let me write that in here, 516.2. And while I'm here, let me just get the other expectants I need. It looks like the answer option in part B was female and almost certain. So let's see, female almost certain. No, we already had it and then it was male almost certain, so that would have been 891.2. So I'm picking those three because those are the three answer options that were presented to me in example 13, so I'm gonna see which of these three contribute the most. All right, so for female 50-50, let me go back. I know I'm sc scooching back and forth a bunch, but female 50-50, we're gonna do observe minus expected squared over expected. So I'm gonna go 447 minus 516.2. I'm gonna square it to make it positive and put it in proportion to 516.2. I'm gonna do the same thing with female almost certain. Observe minus expected, square that difference, put it in ratio to the expected. I'm gonna do it for male and almost certain. 756 minus 891, square that difference and put it in proportion to 891.2. And then I'm gonna see which number was the largest. Or I do have option D, which is saying, hey, they're all three the same. So let, let's find out. So let me erase this. We're gonna go observe minus expected squared over expected. So female 50-50, we had 447 females we observed, 516.2 we expected, and that is in ratio to 516.2. And if you're saying, was there a way for your calculator to do this? Nope. All right, so 447 minus 516.2, let's square it divided by 516.2. All right, so that contributed about 9.3 to that overall test statistic that was around 69.8. Okay, so that's a pretty big contributor, but let's see about female. What did we have? Female plus almost certain. Okay, so we had, we observed 11.74, we expected 10.38.8. We're gonna square that difference and put it in ratio to 10.38.8. All right. Oh, 
looks like, oh, that's even larger. So we've got 17.6 here. As soon as I see that these two answers are not the same, I know D is ruled out. That can't be the answer. Okay, so my last contributor, this will give me my, this will help me make my decision. So this time we're going male and almost certain. All right, so males we observe 756. 891.2 is what we expected in ratio or in proportion to 891.2. So it's 750. And we have, oh, 20. 20.5, 20 that's good enough. Okay, so it actually looks like the largest contributor was the males, all right? And actually they're contributing a good chunk. If you, you look or if you remember from our output, the chi-squared test statistic was 70, so that's a pretty large contributor, proportionally speaking. And if you don't remember the overall test statistic, right, it was 69.8. So that's, that's 20 of those, those units just popping up with that one category. Okay, so we've got that. All right, so moving along, let's see what example 14 is asking of us. All right, so here's the last one on this page of software or your calculator gives a test statistic of 69.8 and a p-value close to zero. Let's just check that. Our p-value, again, not 2.53. Don't forget the e to the negative 14. That's got, this number has 13 zeros in front of it. It is basically zero. All right, the interpretation of this. All right, the probability of getting a random sample of 4,877 teens that yields a value of chi-squared of 69.8 or larger, so or more extreme, if the null is true, is basically zero. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what the p-value is saying. Let's compare that though. Let's make sure we've got this. The probability of getting a random sample of 4,877 teens that yields a value of chi-squared of 69.8 or larger is basically zero. Okay, so if I am comparing and contrasting these, the key phrase here is if the null is true. And that's a huge part of the interpretation of the p-value, right? That's our basic assumption. So this is a much better written sentence than this one. All right, the probability of making a type one error is basically zero. No, that's not true. We have a, a letter for that, that's called alpha. All right, so if you remember, the probability of your type one error is alpha, all right? And that's not the same as the p-value. The only way you can get alpha to be zero is to run the census which is what we did with that Titanic data. All right, and the probability of making a type two error, right, we call that beta. And again, the only way to get those errors to be zero is if you run the census. So our answer here is A, all right? Okay, so we're gonna try a couple more multiple choice. I'll see you in a bit, bye.